I'm going to go right to my guest because I'll tell you, this hour goes by really, really fast. And uh, I want to really have a nice chat with my guest, get a good understanding. And so we're going to go right to the guest. My guest today is Reverend Dr. DeLois Carpenter. She's a senior pastor of Michigan Pat Christian Church and also a professor of religious education at Howard University. Um, Reverend Carpenter, thank you so much for coming on with me. I appreciate it. Well, bless you. It's an honor to be speaking to you and to the Los Angeles area. Yes. Um, um, how are you now? Are you still working at, are you a professor at the University of Howard right now? Howard University? Uh, yes, and yeah. we're putting in senior grades today, right now. <laughs> Graduation is on May the 12th, and I've just finished getting two doctoral students past their defenses and all these other seniors. So it's uh, been a crunch period, but then it's always uh, exciting. Yeah to see the students graduate. And, of course, as you know, this year Oprah Winfrey will be the speaker at the Howard Commencement on May 12th. All right. That's great. Mm-hmm. You know, I, um, I, growing up, I, I always wanted to go to Howard. I never did go. I've gone to the campus to visit the campus, mm-hmm. but I, I definitely have a lot of respect for the school. Wonderful. How do you have time to be a minister, to run a church, and professor? Well, it is difficult. Let me say, first of all, that my congregation is right across the street from the Divinity School. Oh, okay. And over the 22 years that I have been pastoring at Michigan Park Christian Church, Mm -hmm. I've had about 50 uh, different ministers come through who have helped me. So actually, it works well in that um, I meet students here uh, from all different backgrounds, and many of them come and do field education with me, and some of them have come and stayed. So any given year, there are about 10 ministers on staff. They are very helpful, and then I'm in a congregation that stresses lay leadership, and uh, that particular polity makes it possible because the priesthood of all believers, in other words, that every uh, member has a ministry, helps a lot, Uh, and so when I went there, they had good lay leadership, and so we do a lot of training of uh, leaders, I call myself a leader of leaders, so that we delegate uh, certain aspects of the ministry to others, and we have a full-time executive minister there, we have a part-time minister of visitation uh, also, you know, that kind of complements the pastoral office. Right, well, I can understand that. Are you married with children? Uh, I am divorced, but I do have two uh, lovely daughters, um, one is right now in Bogota, Colombia with her family. She's a foreign service officer. And the other is an architect in Boston. Wow. Who is marrying on May 12th. <laughs> really? <laughs> day of graduation here. Wow. Uh, so they keep me pretty busy. And I have my first grandson, Connor. And that has been a great, great joy in my life. And uh, I'm anxious. He'll be a year old May 3rd, and they'll be arriving here May 4th. We're going to have a first birthday party for him in a park near my home. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. I want to talk to you today about salvation, uh, 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 women roles in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the church, the women's role in the church. Um, but before we get into that dialogue, you know, this Don Imus situation is going on and now, uh, there are rappers out there stop snitching who are encouraging young blacks or black people not to report crime uh, within the black communities across the country. Let me first ask you about the Don Imus situation. What's your opinion on that situation? Well, I was uh, glad to see that the African Americans, you know, who worked for these uh, uh, communication industry put pressure on their employers to have him removed. And I think... Um, it is a testament to uh, all of the things that God lined up and strategically placed people to bring pressure to bear uh, on um, the fact that, of course, he's been, you know, reprimanded before for the things he has said about different people and about other black people. But on this, in this particular case, uh, it just seemed like this was the time when, you know, everybody was saying enough is enough. And I do give a lot of credit to the 
African Americans who worked at the television stations, etc. Because when they made the decision to let him go, a lot of that pressure had come from their own African American employees. And so kudos, you know, to them, as well as persons who were speaking out, like Al Sharpton or Jesse Jackson. And uh, there were many. There was a big, you know, outcry yeah. uh, because, of course, these denigrating remarks. Um, we just think of something of the past. But it shows how deep racism is uh, and think- why people think these things are funny. Um, I do not know because it's not a, really a funny matter, I think, sometimes. People use this in jokes. Even our own comedians, I think, uh, should be very careful not to use such language in their uh, comic acts, whether it's on television or in a nightclub or wherever. It would never be really funny to me to hear these things. So you think that he was, uh, Don Imus was racist because he called the female, the black basketball team, uh, nappy headed hoes? Uh, yes, because he also compared them to the other girls and said the other girls were fine and since most of them were black, all except one was black, you have to look at it from a racial perspective. And um, and because of that, you agree that he should have gotten fired. Why not allow the free market to dictate if he should have gotten fired or not? Because if people tune out his show, he well, will I fade think, away. Uh, I think, you know, people did call for uh, sponsors to withdraw their money and no longer run those commercials on his show, and I think that had started happening. That's another factor. He was getting ready to cause them to lose a lot of money. you know. Uh, but it all goes back to because it was distasteful. It was distasteful to everybody. You Do know? you think uh, um, a lot of people said that when he called them nappy-headed hoes, he offended all black women? Did you agree with that? Uh, yes, I think black women have had a long struggle with the perception of their hair and there's a lot of money spent in that industry and then there's the matter of people who wear their hair natural or in a dreadlocks or whatever and women should be free to uh, uh, affirm that their hair is good if it's washed in condition. It's good hair. Nappy hair is definitely a negative um, uh, connotation. It, it, it tries to single that hair out as though there's something wrong with it when really it's not. It may be different, but it's not uh, negative. But that is a negative word. But when he said the the rugged basketball team, he wasn't talking about all black women. It was just specific. He was very specific in that he was talking about the basketball team only. Yeah, but if you looked at those uh, uh, girls. Let me just ask, mm-hmm. though, are, are all black black people like, connected to one another that they felt the pain or something? I don't... Well, I think so because the issue is a long-standing one. And if you looked at those uh, young ladies, beautiful young ladies, role models for our black young women, uh, they were some of the best that we have. I mean, they were uh, intelligent and attractive and they were... Most of them were honor students. And so I think they did represent... um, what black women aspire to be and try to be. And so in a way, yes, calling them, using those words for them, uh, was easy to transfer that to all black women. You know, I hear... They were typical. They were representative, you know, of black women. I I hear a lot of people saying now that those women were intelligent, smart, beautiful, you know, right-on women. But I don't know, I don't think that basketball team has ever won a championship. I don't even believe that most people knew they existed right, prior and so that to, is all the reason why prior to I mean, content. Mm-hmm. That's all the more the reason why well, I say God had lined everything up. You know, by a lot of standards, they weren't even supposed to be in the championship team, but they were. They earned that, and um, therefore... But they, um, they didn't win. They it, never won a championship. It, well, it didn't matter, but they were playing in a championship game. That means the media was covering it. That's the issue that they were put in the spotlight, and he made the comment, and everybody heard it, and then you have the Internet that could play it over and over. So there were many forces that brought this to the attention and to everyone's, um, you know, home uh, or office right. or whatever. And so that, again, shows you the power of the technology, but they happen to be... Uh, 
you know, focused upon at that particular time. And so, therefore, it, to me, it was a good thing that it came out because there are a lot of people that um, say these things to certain, you know, inner circles or they're thinking it yeah. and don't say it. But, but the fact that it was said when and where and how brought it to the nation and the world's attention. I want to move this forward, too, Reverend, because mm-hmm. of time and I, I have mm-hmm. so many issues I want to ask about in order mm-hmm. to enlighten the people. Yeah. Uh, my My next question is I heard a couple of the girls on the team say, that because of what Imus said, that their lives would never be the same, that their life would, they, it, they, it's going to be hard for them to move forward and live a successful life. If they are so wonderful and smart and beautiful, how can they be so weak that a man can call them nappy headed hoes and all of a sudden life is over? Well, I don't think it's over. I think they were feeling the pain of that particular moment. I happen to know Reverend Buster's stories. Uh, he pastors the coach and a couple of those girls right. and was instrumental in uh, having a meeting with Don and Mrs. Imus so the girls could express why they felt so badly. And they were articulate. You know, some of that was aired. They were able to explain what they meant by that, which was that, at that moment, you know, when you um, disempower people, when you put people down, it, it can uh, leave a scar on people. It can cause them to question their appearance or their ability. I think they'll rise above it. In fact, I know they will, I think. But at that moment when it happened, they felt devastated, and I would have felt devastated. Also, if something like that happened to my daughters, you know, they're uh, 35 and 31, a little older, but even at their age, I would have worried, you know, that it would cause some measure of self-doubt. But I hope by now enough people have uh, rallied. And with the outcome, I think it helps the healing a lot. And they they will be healed and go on. And I agree with you. Uh, This is not going to ruin their lives. I hope it just makes them more dedicated, you know, to standing up for themselves. 888-775-3773. My guest is Reverend Dr. DeLois Carpenter. We're going to take a break. Lines are wide open for you. We got to really move this conversation forward. I'm enjoying this a whole lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, we got to take a break, uh, Reverend, and be back in a moment. All right. Thank you. Okay. Back. My guest is Reverend Dr. DeLois Carpenter. She's also the pastor, senior pastor of Michigan Park Christian Church. And we're going to tell you how to get in touch with the Reverend. Maybe you're in the area there. You'd like to go to one of her meetings. And uh, before we leave the airway, so get ready to write the information down. Uh, Reverend Carpenter, uh, 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 one other thing about I'm in situation, I'd like to get a better understanding from you about um, Al Shopton and Jesse Jackson and other so-called black leadership went after him in order to fire him because it was a white or black situation. And Shopton and Jackson are, are hypocrites and that they have said racist things, and, um, you know, Jackson is known for cheating on his wife, uh, yet they appear to be the gatekeepers of the uh, black communities across the country. Do you think that they are hypocrites, and were you embarrassed that they came out to represent black folks? No, they both have been out leading movements uh, for the last 30 or 40 years, so... Uh, the matter of their personal lives or what they did is not the issue. We have to look at what was the issue that was focused upon. And I was proud to see them out there. Um, I think they both have learned to work the media. I don't like the word manipulate. I think they understand uh, that this would be a story that the media was already involved in and would be following up on. I think they do have quite a bit of savvy when it comes to the media. Uh, but I think you have to give them credit for the good they've done. You know, each of them have a long history of civil rights activism, and so it wasn't out of character for them. I mean, we we would have expected them to be out there. And I'll tell you this: had it not been for Al Sharpton, I would have never known about the story because I had missed uh, it. I don't listen to the I'm a show. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't see it on the Internet, but I heard a report on the radio saying that Reverend Sharpton was complaining, and that's what got my interest, and I figured that uh, if he was, then it was something I needed to look into, and then I started doing some research. So I think in a way they sounded the alarm, and that led, uh, moved people into action. Do you think they they should, do you think Jackson and Sharpton should have 
lost their jobs when they used racial terms toward Jews and white people. Yeah, well, I, you know what? I'm not as familiar with those instances. Are you familiar with the Kowale Brawley situation in New York? Uh, somewhat. But yeah. you know what? You have to take each issue as it comes and talk about the merits of that. You know, because the truth is the truth, no matter who says it. And to try to discredit, you know, the messenger is not really appropriate. You have to look at actually what what had happened now. Uh, so I think they were right on. My other question, and, and then I want to ask you about the stop snitching thing that's going on. Harry Belafonte once called Dr. Condoleezza Rice a, a uh, house token or something like that because she works for President Bush. Um, I didn't hear an outrage from Sharpton or Jackson or any of those guys when he called her a house token or a house slave. Why? And I mean, that didn't seem to ruin her career, her life or her, her feeling. And she's a black woman. Why we didn't hear this? Why didn't we hear the same outcry from black people about her as we do or did with the basketball team? Well, there's several things. First of all, that phrase, a house token, is not as offensive as, you know, a nappy head hoe and wannabes. I mean, these these uh, were more emotion-provoking words and have a long history. Uh, I can't say why, you know, they didn't uh, attack this other thing that Belafonte did, but I can just say that there was a long history on, on these words and, so much time has gone past now since these other incidents. So, you know, I kind of forgot right. about, you know, the, the issues. But we shouldn't be stereotyping people. We shouldn't be using denigrating remarks about anyone. And that's the conversation about, um, you know, being civilized, being decent uh, in our speech uh, toward everyone. And then finally, of course, this thing about Imus uh, being on the uh, television, I think, if it was just the radio, it would have been less offensive than television because television has certain strict guidelines, FCC, uh, that prohibits these type of things from happening because it goes into the homes, little children hear it, and, you know, imagine all the conversation and families, little children asking mommy and daddy, well, what, what does this mean? What do these words mean? So that's the reason the FCC is a little more strict uh, on the, these television programs, as I think they should be. Uh, stop snitching. A lot of rappers or some rappers are encouraging through their rap crap, encouraging blacks not to report black criminals, even if it's murder within the black community. How are you feeling about that? Well, I think that's terrible. I think um, communities take pride in themselves as they exercise some measure of social control uh, to uh, keep the people that live in their vicinity in line. I mean, that's what makes a neighborhood and a community. And so that message uh, that we shouldn't report persons that are harming um, the community, I, I don't agree with that. I think that's wrong. It's sending the wrong message. Uh, rather, we need the community to work with the police yeah. so that we can have safe neighborhoods where our children can play safely and our elderly people can won't have to be in fear of, uh, you know, crimes uh, that might occur. And everybody should try to participate uh, to um, discourage criminal behavior, not ignore it. I blame uh, the so-called civil rights leaders for this stop snitching idea because uh, this whole campaign of uh, bashing police officers, especially when it's a police on black situation, started 10 years ago with Maxine Waters, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, uh, marching in the street shouting, no justice, no peace. Al Shopton and others uh, accusing police officers of being racist and that they don't, uh, you know, they don't like black people. So they, they started this distrust of police officers within the black community. So well, I blame them for that. Am I wrong? I beg to differ. You know, as a kid growing up in a little town called Towson, Maryland, black people have been afraid of police for a long, long time, long before a magazine was marching or Jesse or Al were out marching. You know, when I was a kid growing up and uh, that town was called Little Georgia, black people were afraid that if the police came and took you away, we'd never see you again. There was a lot of community 
pressure to keep you in line and not to have any involvement with the police because there was not a belief in the justice system uh, of America based on the way blacks had been treating, often didn't get a fair trial, et cetera. And so, no, this, this, you can't blame this on the civil rights movement. I think uh, the civil rights movement was just trying to get equality for all persons. But how do you get equality by blaming the officers instead of the black criminals. I mean, the police. Well, yes, you can find some bad cops in any situation, but the policemen would come into the black community or go into the black community to protect the people. But instead, the so-called black leadership would attack the cops rather than attacking the criminals. Well, I haven't seen that. I, re- I recall that as a conversation on racial profiling, which means you shouldn't be uh, arresting, detaining, stopping black people just because of their color uh, as, as a prime suspect for something when there was no, no real grounds or evidence. Uh, that they had committed a crime. I think that was more of the issue they were working on. I don't know, you know, what happened in Los Angeles. I wasn't there, right. but I will say that that matter of racial profiling, I did attend the march here in Washington, and Al Sharpton was speaker, and uh, I think it's very true. We had a meeting at our church. In fact, we had the police come there and explain to people, you know, how they should conduct themselves when police are present. Because people were scared, black men especially were scared that they would get pulled over um, and that they would do something, would be interpreted, you know, as well, that um, was primar- criminal. Mm-hmm. That was primarily because uh, black, not all, but many black men are out there committing crimes within the black community, black on black crime out of control. And so they were afraid because of the image, this image that blacks are putting out there themselves. And it's well, unfortunate that sometimes the good have to suffer with the bad. Yeah, well, I don't think it's the blacks putting it out there themselves. I think it is. The media highlights the negative stories and doesn't show the good. It's not balanced. And so in every community, you're going to have a few people who are criminal, but the vast majority are not going to be criminal, so you can't reach the conclusion, therefore, all black men are criminals. That was what was wrong with it. Well, again, they hadn't, I don't think they made a decision that all black men were criminals, but because of uh, a high number of black men and now women committing crimes within the black community, you know, the cops don't know who is who when they stop you. And if there is, we, we all been told that the cop is our enemy, you tend to become angry about that. And when you become angry, whenever you stop, it, it brings on fear that because you're black, you're going to go do something with the police officer. So you tend to act in that way. And I think that's how this brainwashing thing took place, is that the civil rights leaders, along with a lot of the black preachers, convinced black folks that the cops hated all of us, and that's why this reaction is there. Am I wrong? Yeah, you're wrong. Uh, I, I, I can give you another example. I lived in a town where I was only we were the only black family. And a very well-respected gentleman, very decent man came, and he got detained and pulled over in regards to a bike robbery. He had nothing to do with it, but uh, what they took him through was awful. He said he'd never come down that road again. You have to admit that these things happen. Not all police do it, but if you had a few that did it, then you have to acknowledge that was happening. Now, what we need is dialogue, and that's why we had the meeting at the church. We had the police come and the community so that we could dialogue about uh, what the procedures were and what actions uh, were appropriate or not when people were police pulled them over. So, I mean... uh, that that's a reality that these things did happen and people just need to have education and they need to have dialogue. We're coming to the bottom of the hour break and when I come back I want to start out with salvation and really point to this. But I want to ask before we go to break, in having these dialogues and they have happened across the country, in having these dialogues about quote unquote police brutality, how to deal with police, how do you solve the problem without dealing with the whole problem. Yes, there's a proper way that we should act toward the police officers, but there's also uh, people on the other side who are encouraging bad behavior within the black community, the so-called leadership, the black leadership. They encourage this bad behavior. When the people start to act it out, they blame the cops for it, 
and then they bring the cops in to have dialogue, but it's a one-sided dialogue. They don't deal with the black leadership who encourages bad behavior. How do you solve the problem without dealing with the whole picture? Well, everybody does what they can. Uh, you know, you have to, many tears, so some people have to address the other side of the problem if the black leaders are telling them not to report criminals and someone needs to work on that, and people are. And remember this, no one activist or leader can attack all sides of any problem. And so we, other people need to be addressing that other side. Yeah, but that's not happening. Well, I think it is, yes. In Washington, D.C., we have had quite a bit of publicity about calling and reporting crimes and, you know, our council okay. people and what have you. Yes, there have been many meetings, and there's been commercials on the radio, the television. Yes, a lot of attention has been given. Rebel, also. let me take a bottom of the hour break. Okay. 888-77-JESSE, 888-77-JESSE. Back in a moment with Reverend Delores Carpenter. All right. All right. Welcome back to the show. I can't believe how fast this time is going. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, on Monday through Friday, it's 10 to 12 noon Pacific time. So uh, feel free to tune in. We are heard around the world by everybody and their mama. My name is Jesse Lee Peterson. If you'd like to call in, the number is 888-77-JESSE, 888 my guest is Reverend Dr. DeLois Carpenter. She is a senior pastor of Michigan Park Christian Church and also a professor of religion uh, education at Howard University. And so, uh, uh, again, Reverend, thank you for coming on. I really, I'm it's having a good pleasure. time. My pleasure. I, I wanna, thank you for inviting me. Oh, yes. I want to talk to you about salvation. Mm -hmm. What is salvation and how do you find it? Well, as a Christian, um, we talk about salvation being through belief in Jesus Christ, specifically that he uh, rose from the dead. The resurrection is the centerpiece of that salvation. Of course, there could have been no resurrection without the death, the shedding of his blood that atones for our sins. And uh, that believing uh, in Christ entails also uh, living in a way that... Um, follows his teaching and incorporates his values. So when he said, go make disciples of all, baptizing them and teaching them to observe whatever things I have commanded you. And so salvation is also about behavior. It is your belief and your faith, but it's also your behavior. Does our behavior exemplify the uh, the tenets that Jesus taught, him being the great teacher. So, you know, love is a very big part of that. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. But he also taught about, you know, being merciful and um, uh, all those things in the Beatitudes, I think, also point out what his value system was and that um, we are to live counterculture. In other words, we don't live by the the rules of the world, but we live according to the teachings of Jesus that um, was life-giving, that didn't um, show any partiality to one group over another, but that we embrace everyone, you know, as we would want to be embraced, you know, we call right. the golden rule. So your lifestyle should change yes. once you find salvation or born again. Yes, that should be a change in lifestyle. And then you're called to serve, you know, feed the hungry and uh, visit those in prison and, you know, be in the business of helping to bring peace. So uh, it's not just what you personally, uh, where you are, but also right. what are you are doing to transform, transform the world, which is social justice, sometimes it's social service, but the bringing of the kingdom of heaven to earth as it is in heaven, which we pray in the Lord's Prayer, but I think uh, that's part of salvation, too, that we participate in the coming of that kingdom. Let me, I, I want to go back to another question really fast and then move forward about the salvation thing. Um, there's a lot of dialogue now about women becoming pastors and heads of the homes and things like that. Um, are you called by God, or did you go to school to become a pastor? Yeah. No, called by God. I first preached when I was 16 years old, and I was the first woman. I was licensed at 16 and ordained at 18, first woman in the Progressive Free Will Baptist Conference of Baltimore. And I struggled very, very extensively 
from 14 years old to 16 years old before I accepted my call because you didn't have women role models right. and people would tell you it's not right. So I went through a terrible depression as a teenager when this is what I felt God wanted me to do, but this wasn't what people were going to affirm, and it took the death of a woman minister in my church. It's kind of like when she died, I picked up the mantle. And she was a great inspiration in my life. And last time I saw her, she said, um, Dolores, why don't you do what God is calling you to do? She had some insight into what I would be doing. She uh, alluded to possible calling. And so at her funeral, I acknowledged uh, that uh, God had called me to preach. The first time publicly, I had acknowledged that. And God blessed me because once I started, I had a tremendous... Um, uh, affirmation, and in early days, I was the first woman to preach as a reverend in hundreds of churches, and sometime the pastor would say, I didn't want her here, but the young people <laughs> invited her, or, you know, something like that, so I knew I was a pioneer, but I think when you're young, you're really bold, you're courageous, and you're idealistic, so I'm glad uh, God called me when I was young, and plus, it's been a beautiful life. At 16, what was happening to make you think? that caused you to think that God was calling you? What was going on? Well, I had been re a student of the Bible since I was a child. My grandmother wrote religious tracts, and I had a very great mastery of the Scripture at a very young age. I discovered the religion section of the public library. So I was reading great sermons, the commentaries, theology, you know, even before I went to college. I was in high school. And uh, I, you know, sought God, and I sought the gift of the Holy Spirit in my life, and God and I had a relationship in a sense that I could sense when God was speaking to me, when God was uh, directing my path, which was my prayer, and is in doing that, uh, God even showed me in a vision where I had uh, been teaching little children when I was a child the stories of the Bible and that this is what God wanted me to devote my life to. Were you raised by your father? No, I was raised by my mother and we lived in an extended family. It was kind of matriarchal. My grandmother, my mother, her sister, and her husband. Now, Uncle Donald <laughs> was the male figure. He was my uncle in right. home at a young age and he was a wonderful man. Unfortunately, you know, we lost him uh, much too soon. But there was a man in the home, my uncle, and there was the three generations. And they all went to church, so you grew up in church. Actually, uh, we lived in a semi-rural area, and my grandmother was the only one that was deeply into religion and right. talked about it in the home at that time, in that phase of her life right. where she was uh, semi-invalid, having lost a leg when she was eight years old trying to go to school on an open back truck. But she fell out and the truck ran over her leg. Wow. So she was heavy and she didn't adapt well to prosthesis, so she was on crutches. And I was the oldest grandchild, so I was, you know, back and call to help her in a wide variety of ways. Right. And one of those ways was to study whenever the Baptist deacons would come, the Pentecostal preachers would come, the, uh, even the... Uh, Jehovah Witness would come, and she'd be studying, and I'd be right there with them. Oh, and so, uh, in a way, I had a great um, interest and background in all of this through her. And then I discovered in my own thinking, and young, and thinking about God, and things, that this was a very expansive thing. I love this. Right. And so, my school, my principal, would run the tracks for my grandmother. I would take them, and I would help her with the spelling. Uh, she only had a third grade education. I was very smart in school, so I could spell and I could write, and um, we were like a little team. And then she would take us out for ministry to the tuberculosis ward of a city hospital. And so I, she taught us whatever we could do to do it for the Lord. So and you've just been involved all your life then. Absolutely. Let absolutely. me, uh, do you believe in the spiritual order of God in Christ, Christ in man, man over woman and woman over children? Do you believe in that spiritual well, order? Well, I don't see it as a hierarchy because that was not biblical. That's uh, from Christian, that's from philosophy. But that's in the, the Bible, chain though. Of command. But yeah, but uh, it was influenced by Greek philosophy of that day. So you don't. But know. I look at Jesus and how he related to women, and there are many, many 
women throughout the Old and New Testament who were leaders and who God used, you know, on page after page. There, but there's there. nowhere, or is there anywhere in the Bible where uh, it states that God called women to be preachers uh, and where he called them to be preachers or ministers or oh, yes. where is that in the Bible? He called women to do many things in the Bible. But uh, remember, women were the first one to take the message that Christ is risen. Where is that it was the, right on Easter morning. I know, but where is it in the Bible? Where in the Bible? Where in the Bible does he it's in call all them the to, be a, to be a it's preacher? All four Gospels in with the women being there early in the morning. And it was the women who got the message from the angels. And, uh, of course, Jesus appeared to Mary in the garden and told, go tell my disciples too. So the women actually were the first ones to preach the resurrection. And then when Jesus was on the Emmaus Road and uh, some of the disciples, they didn't recognize him. And they said, these women said these things and we didn't believe it. But Jesus likens these women unto the prophets because he said, neither did they believe the prophets of old. Uh, in other words, he's saying these women were being prophetic, and that was really how got the whole thing called so, Christianity started. So you don't believe in that spiritual order of man over woman, but you do believe that because of those examples you just gave me, that was in the Bible, you do believe that that's from God. I believe that God is no respecter of persons. As he said, in Christ there is neither male nor female, Greek nor Jew, slave nor free. I think that um, God is a spirit and he works through spiritual means that uh, crosses every gender, class, race. Those are man-made categories. Let me ask this, Reverend, because of time, too. I'm sorry about Mm this. Um, If God intended for women to head up, to be over men, to be the head, why is it that, and, and this, why is it that when women take over, things fall apart? For example, for the last fifty years or so, the black woman, for the most part, exception to the rule, has been ahead of the family, and now is in a, I mean, just a state of emergency, destruction everywhere. They are taking well, over the churches, and the churches are falling apart. They took okay. over the government. And and the government just, I mean, we grew and got more as people became more involved, the government spending and stuff like that. Why do things fall apart when women take over if God intended for it to be that way? Well, first of all, it's very untrue. It's not based on, that's not a true fact. And secondly, what part is not true? And secondly, that's just ignorant. It's out of people's ignorance that they say and believe such a thing as that. Is it true? There is no evidence to that. Uh, it's not true that most of the black homes are operated or headed up by black women. That's not true. Well, that may be true, but there is no so, research to show. There is no research to show that that is the cause of problems in the black family. There is no research to show that. In fact, most of the research that I've looked at says that that's not an important factor. Poverty is a factor. Other things are a factor. So you're not aware of the stats that says that. 70% 70% of black babies are born out of wedlock, so they're in single parents' home, and that is the primary reason for crime and out of, well, out of wedlock aware, birth. You know what? I'm aware that people say that, but it's nonsense. It's not based on actual scientific studies and social science as we read it and teach it. People, you know, you had Moynihan talk about the pathologies of family, and he got greatly shot down because it wasn't based on real facts, and I don't really have time to break all these studies right. down to yeah. you, I don't want to get into but that I want to say this to you, that that is just out of people not being aware of how there are many variables, and when you start breaking down these problems, there are other factors. That may be a factor, but that factor alone, because see, many great leaders have come out of single, uh, mother-headed homes, and what we need to do is to give these women a great deal of credit for having to be both mother and father and doing a tremendous job. I myself, uh, you know, was raised primarily by my mother, and uh, it's not true that more of those people are criminals. That's just not true. Let's but take a break, have- Reverend. Hold, hold on. I'm, i got to take a quick break. We'll sure. be back in a moment. Okay, we are back. Sorry about that. I pressed okay, the wrong sure. button. Thank you, Billy. Mm-hmm. 
my engineer is right here helping me out. All right. Um, 888-77-JESSE, 888-53773. Reverend Dr. Delores Carpenter is my guest. Uh, she's a senior pastor of Michigan Park Christian Church, also a professor of religion, of religion education at uh, Howard University. Uh, Reverend, I, I, I want to do a fast pace now. Okay. Um, so you and I disagree that once a woman took over, everything, everything, once a woman takes over, everything seems to fall, fall apart. I strongly and I disagree use with that. <laughs> I, I use the black community as an example for the last 50 years. The black woman, for the most part, such as to the rule, has been the head of the family. And now the average black man is weak and pathetic. The children are having children. Abortion is out of control. Homosexuality running the community. AIDS is taking over. And I don't believe it would be that if the man was the head of his family, guiding his wife and children in the right way to go. And you disagree with me on that, right? Oh, totally. You yeah. totally. You've got to do a much more analysis than that. And, in fact, uh, I just left a doctoral dissertation on women in the ministry. I, I wrote a book called Time for Honor, and actually it showed where uh, it's on black women who finish seminary who have a Master of Divinity degree, and it showed when they got in these churches, the churches are better off and they're thriving. That's certainly true of my church, and so I think... People, well, they do thrive, you're right, in that... They, and they grow. They don't fall apart. Yeah, you're right I've about that part. For 22 years of my church is stronger today than it was when I got there. I agree that women tend to bring in a lot of other women, so they bring in money. Those women bring the purse, you know. They bring the money, and they bring. So they, the churches do grow in in a physical sense, and I but have morally, of, and I have a lot of men in my church too, and uh, it's just a strong, well established church. But morally, Reverend, you got to admit the church fall apart morally no. because you know when women take over. No, 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 no. There's no such thing. In fact. It's just the opposite because women usually hold to a higher moral standard. That was why some people wrote they didn't want men, women to become ministers because they had a higher moral code than these male preachers do. Oh, okay. Um, I can go on and on, but because of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also want to ask, do you believe in good and evil or right and wrong? Yes, I think everybody, yes, as, as Paul says, we have a conscience within How do, us. Right. How do we recognize evil when we see it in another person? How, do, how can we recognize it? Well, first of all, you've got to know the Word of God because that's, that's the understanding of what is good and what is right, right according to the biblical record. And as you learn that, then you can measure everything up against uh, that plumb line. If a man or a woman call themselves a man or a woman of God, they've been called by God, and they're born again, called by God, they have his nature, could they represent evil? Could they still represent evil? Uh, no, I think that um, sometimes by silence we participate and contribute to evil systems of this world because we don't always speak out. Right. But if it is a clean vessel, then it's not going to be having evil come out of it. You know, the Bible says a good tree will bring forth good fruit. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so would we have to know the Bible in order to recognize Absolutely. good and evil? I'm a great advocate on knowing the Bible. I believe everybody should study the Bible in as much depth as they can, and my church is known for its Bible classes, and uh, I teach a class at the seminary on church Bible study, because to me, uh, prayer and Bible study is the two foundations and pillows of the spiritual uh, beings, and therefore, uh, but unfortunately, uh, we have many people who haven't had, haven't learned that word. So first thing I try to do is get them in the word and yeah. and as they learn and it grows and then to seek the Holy Spirit. We say something, the Bible has the first word, the Holy Spirit has the last word. Yeah. But you know, we both can read something and come up with a different interpretation. So it's very important that people be spiritually grounded too so that they can have an interpretation uh, that is of God. I have a quick test that I ask all of my guests, no matter who mm-hmm. it is. But first I want to ask, do you respect men who allow themselves to be under women, guided by women? Yes. Whether it's a wife or or 
or church situation, do you respect men who allow women to be over them? Well, this is the way I put it. Whoever is, you know, has the answer or the key or the ability and the strength in that particular area because life is complex and there will be some times when the, the woman will be the greater leader in that area. There'll How about in the home? Time, there will, and in the home, too, there may be some time when the man is the greater leader. For example, some women are better money managers, so whoever's the better. No, I meant like head. I meant spiritual head of the family. Yeah, but no, I don't Would I don't. you respect a man who allow? let's say if you were married, would you respect your husband if he allowed you to be spiritually over him? I believe in Paul's mutual submission. What does that mean? Based on the gifts that God has given the individual, we submit to one another. It doesn't have to do with gender. That's what I told you earlier. A lot of that philosophical teaching of hegemony and chain of command, that was Greek Gnosticism. That comes from Aristotle and the whole Roman caste system. But would you agree, but, though, Reverend, uh, women, not all, not all, not all, but women tend to make decisions based on emotions Oh, no. Whereas men tend to make decisions based on logic. <laughs> no, that's another myth. I think uh, it depends on the ability that God has given the individuals. And you have to go on a case-by-case basis. And together we be the best that we can develop, the best life together that we can, the best family that we can. And I don't think it is along gender lines. People are different. There are some men are more emotional than some women. They're, you know, it, you can't... And that's true, but they get that like from... It. They get that from their mothers and grandmothers. You know, it does, like, no, emotion comes from God. Everybody's got some emotion. These are just differences in people's personalities, temperaments. Sometimes they're born this way. Then some of it is from their religious upbringing. That's true. But when two people come together, they are the best judge of who is going to lead in what. Somebody, you can't make one rule that stands for everybody because God created all of us and he gave different gifts, just like Paul said, the body of Christ. And one can't say, I don't need you or this or that. It's the, all of it working together. And that is better left, I think, to people to decide in their own marriages and in their own I want to do my, my quick good okay. and evil okay. right and wrong <laughs> test, and then I want you to give out your information. Okay. We're going to do a right and wrong. Homosexuality, right or wrong? Well, I think it's wrong. Um, uh, David Duke, good or evil? Who is David Duke? The, uh, the KKK? Yes, person? yes. That's wrong. Is that evil or good? That's evil. Uh, Jesse Jackson, good or evil? He's good. He's good. Even though he cheated on his wife, made a baby. Well, everybody in the Bible separated. Had, listen, everybody in the Bible had flaws. But he's the not Bible in the Bible. Said, the Bible said if you say you have not sinned, you're a liar. Everybody has sinned. And everybody has an entitled to forgiveness. But he's God. not this as being a preacher and being married. Well, so did David, and he was a king. And so you can't go by the category, we're all human beings. What I'm trying to say is God can forgive. There is nothing that God can't forgive. You can't judge a person on one act. Uh, Trent Lott, you know who Trent Lott is, right? Trent Lott. The, the senator? congressman of senators. Yeah. What did he do? Is he, uh, remember, he, uh, he apparently made friendship with, uh, oh, my mind is going dumb. They went after him because they call him a racist. He celebrated with um, a senator who is now dead, and at one point he was uh, a racist. Tom Thurman, yes. remember that name. Right. Uh, Anybody, Trent Lott. Race, racism is wrong. Is Trent Lott good or evil? Here again, you can't label a person good or evil based on one part or one act. You have to look at the total person. You have to know a lot more about the person than one thing. Abortion, good or evil? That's not good. That's evil. It's evil. So you don't afford, support abortion? No, but I think it's up to the woman to, to decide. Now, I will say that. It's up to the woman to decide if she want to kill right, her but baby? I would, n- I would never do it. I, d- I would not right. consider it. But we're, we're, how, why do you say it's up to the woman to decide if she because should kill her baby? Because we're all going to be judged by the light that we are given. And that person has to go before God on their own. On based on what they know of the scripture and what God has spoken to them. Is it up to the father to tell her not to do it? I don't understand that. It, let's say the woman say the, the woman say I want to kill the baby inside of my womb. The father say no, you can't do that. Does he have a right to that as well? No, I think it's up to the woman. And the father has no say so. 
Well, sure. Everybody has say so and have input on in your thinking and will influence. He can influence her, but ultimately she has to make the decision. It's her body. It's her body. Yes, it is. Do you teach uh, homosexuals that they can overcome that? Well, I don't teach people by labels of homosexuality. That's not something we delve in. You know, we're an academic institution. And when I approach people, I approach them as a child of God. But I mean at your church, at a park. I don't ask them those questions. I don't go around asking people, are they homosexual? But don't you counsel with them sometimes? No, that doesn't come up. Because I I treat them, everybody the same, and I don't like labels. Because I don't ask people, you know, if they ever had an affair or the adulterer, or I don't ask heterosexual people about their sex life, so why should I ask a homosexual? Reverend, my last question then, I want your information to give out real fast. Okay. Uh, 90% of black Americans support the Democratic platform, and the platform itself is anti-God. You know, they're taking um, God out of the schools. They, no, you know they, why I want to stop you right now, because I've had councilmen that the, the local Democratic Party meets in my church, and I know they're not anti-God. So that's, well, not that's all a the, ridiculous statement. <laughs> right. <laughs> not the people no. necessarily, not the people, Reverend, but the platform no, is anti-God. No, I think if you ask Jimmy Carter, he has a lot of religion, so it's... When all these people have faith in some semblance of God, I've never met. But Jim, uh, Jimmy a Carter politician. is not a Jimmy Carter is not is a man of of sound mind. He 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 doesn't know what he's doing. He's excellent. Habitat for Humanity. He's great on women in the ministry. You haven't seen a smarter, greater leader than Jimmy Carter. Do you think Bill Clinton is excellent too? He's very smart, and I think he's going to do a lot of good for world peace right now. Do you think he's an evil man or good? No, he, I don't think he's evil. Oh, no, you don't. No, now that's what I say. You can't call a person evil just because you don't but like Christ they did, did or said. Christ called people evil when he was talking about a specific behavior. But that's what I'm talking about: specific behaviors. Well, you didn't tell me a specific behavior. Well, Bill Clinton lied. He cheated on his wife. Well, he perjured wrong himself. To lie. It's he, wrong to lie. It's wrong to cheat on his wife. But that's not the totality of everything he has done. But doesn't that make him evil, though? No, no. Why? It make, doesn't make him good. Think, I think if you've got a thousand things, two things that happen to you don't make you evil. Those things are evil, but it doesn't make you evil. But if those things are inside of you evil, aren't you what you what comes out of you? No, he 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 confessed that that was wrong and he repented. No, he did it. They twisted his arm to make him do it. Well, he did. I mean, I heard him say, "Reverend, how can how can people?" He said he was sorry. You know, (laughs) so would you trust? Would you marry and trust him? Uh. No, because I don't even know him. I mean, Reverend, I, what's your number? I'm so sorry. How can people get in touch with okay. you? Okay, well, it was good to be with you, and please, please get in touch me with me at the church at area code 202-526-3355. That's 202-526-3355. We are a congregation lifting up the name of Jesus, and we have a saying. It's where the feast of the Lord is always going on. We're a spirit-filled, Bible-centered church.